what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about ethnobotany and uh, really how I've been so <clears throat> deeply moved by the remarkable understanding of plants by indigenous people. I'd like to talk about how we've used their understanding to uh, uh, move forward on conservation of precious habitats and then sort of end up the last half of my remarks with understanding patterns of uh, wellness and illness among indigenous people to discover new drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what I'm speaking about is in this uh, uh, book recently published and which is selling dozens of copies throughout the world. But I think publisher told me that uh, uh, Kathy King bought one. So there we go. Um, I'm uh, currently uh, uh, work at the Brain Chemistry Labs in Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, and I'm chairman of Seacology. I'll mention both of those in a minute. So <clears throat> I became very interested in the Great Basin in winnowing baskets. Here's a photograph in 1936 of Maggie Tavus Howard, a member of the Paiute Nation, demonstrating winnowing uh, in the Yosemite Valley. Um, so uh, I've been looking around in uh, uh, art dealers and uh, secondhand stores, antique shops, trying to find some of these winnowing baskets. They're really uh, beautiful and remarkable. All these are from the Great Basin. And I think what I find so extraordinary about them is that they're used for a very utilitarian purpose. For example, people would put in grain, say Orizopsis or uh, sometimes pinion nuts, put in uh, <clears throat> hot coals, toss them in the air, and the chaff blows away. Um, but what I find is that uh, even in these ordinary objects, were, which were not made for trade or sale, there's this beauty that's woven in and the mastery of these uh, uh, great basin Native Americans uh, is, is really uh, ju just extraordinary. I also had a <clears throat> wonderful opportunity um, early in my career to spend uh, a lot of time out on the Goshute Reservation in Ibapa, uh, where I uh, watched Evelyn Pete, who is a member of the Duckwater Shoshone Nation and um, married a Goshute. And to see her weave one of these baskets, and it, which uh, she made for me, there's a winnowing basket. Again, I love the patina of use. Uh, and, and, and what's amazing with Evelyn is that she can just split the type of willows uh, into three parts while talking to you and, and continue to make the basket. Um, she tells me that. Uh, it's very hard for her to find the right uh, ethno species of willows. And she sometimes has to travel up to Montana now to get the right type of willows for the weaving. Um, but these are beautiful objects and uh, used in an important way. Uh, I had some uh, graduate students uh, with me one time and <clears throat> I could see they were sort of puzzled. Why, why do you find this so remarkable? And I said, Evelyn, would you stop a minute? I said, let's see how many of you can split a willow into three pieces longitudinally. Uh, just that one simple task which you have to do to begin weaving and none of them could do it, of course. Um, in my interviews with the uh, members of the Goshute Nation, uh, particularly with elderly people, uh, I met some who actually had been grown up in a hunter-gatherer society. Uh, my anticipation was that this would be a very difficult way to live uh, and they dissuaded me of that. To them, they had such a broad palette of indigenous plants that they could use for food that if you know the cattails weren't working then they could go for the biscuit root uh, uh, and what they basically saw each morning when they woke up was uh, a sort of the world as a candy store it was just a marvelous experience anyway uh i uh, early in my career uh, was able to uh, obtain uh, funding uh from the white house of all places to do any sort of research i wanted to do so I took my family um, to a very remote island in Samoa called Savai'i. I'd uh, been a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints there and uh, learned the language. Uh, I had not been in this village, but because my mother had died of breast cancer, uh, I decided to take a year with my family and we, Barbara and I moved to this place. We still live in this little hut for a year uh, no electricity, no running water. Had our four children, just my research gear and their school books. But we had a just a terrific experience there with the people. And uh, that led to two things. First of all, the discovery of a new uh, 
uh, anti-HIV AIDS drug uh, Prostratin with my colleagues at the National Cancer Institute. And then uh, creation of a new uh, conservation organization. When we found out that a foreign logging firm had come in and started cutting the forest down where the plant that produced the AIDS molecule was at the anti-AIDS molecule, um, <clears throat> I asked the villagers, you know, why'd you let this lo these loggers in here? And they explained that they were required by the government to build a new school or the government would pull the teachers from their village. They explained since they uh, were, you know, just reforagers and uh, indigenous agriculturalists, they didn't have the money to pay. Um, the, uh, uh, I said, well, what if I could raise the money? Could you stop these guys? So they sent two uh, chiefs up to the uh, loggers, chased them away. Uh, Barbara and I uh, uh, went to the development bank and I assumed as a uh, personal indebtedure, the uh, uh, note, um, Barbara offered to, to uh, you know, mortgage our house uh, uh, and friends and some students found out and within six weeks we'd put together uh, $85,000 to uh, um, build the school and uh, <clears throat> had purchased essentially the logging rights right out from under the loggers and saving uh, about a 30,000 hectare, excuse me, 30,000 acre rainforest. Um, that was a great day in my life. Um, so here, here was the little school that we built um, and the village promised to uh, protect the rainforest for a, a 55 year period. Later, uh, a local Utah firm, New Skin uh, International, made a gift to build a aerial walkway. That's my daughter Jane on that, um, high above the forest so that the people could generate uh, an income uh, from visitors and tourists without damaging the forest. This led to the creation of a new um, conservation organization called Seacology, uh, which we established in Berkeley. I, that was my first job after graduate school was at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, assistance from, uh, again, another Utah <clears throat> friend and uh, industrialist, Ken Murdoch. Um, we uh, have, have basically what we do is we uh, help indigenous people protect their forest or their coral reef, and then in return for building a community of needs. So here in Tuvalu, <clears throat> we build a handicraft center for women in return for them starting to uh, replenish their mangroves. Um, here in Madagascar, <clears throat> these people agreed to protect the forest and all the lemurs in them. If we'd build them a school, we found out that children from another village wanted to come to the school and were swimming across the river to get there, which is seasonal. Um, so we built the bridge and to give you an indication of how much education means these people, we couldn't get helicopters in the Southern part of Madagascar so the villagers carried everything for that bridge and that school on their backs three days, because this village is three days from the nearest uh, uh, road. Um, and, and now, the, of course, this very biodiverse uh, area is protected by the indigenous people. Um, in Sri Lanka, we built uh, a mangrove preserve and a women's handicraft center and walkway. The president visited, the president of Sri Lanka, and. Uh, asked if we'd like to do that for the whole country. So we made a deal to make microloans for 12,000 coastal women. These were small amounts of money, 100 or $150. Uh, and uh, two weeks of business training, uh, they all sort of started building their own really cool micro enterprises. Some got a sewing machine and started sewing clothing. Others uh, got like a shave ice machine. And in return, Sri Lanka and these women promised to protect uh, 21,000 acres of mangrove forest, essentially all the mangroves of Sri Lanka. As part of this, we uh, established uh, three very large nurseries in disparate parts of Sri Lanka, uh, each producing about half a million uh, seedlings of native mangrove species. And the reason we're so, uh, uh, I think mangrove preservation is so important is that uh, these plants sequester more carbon um, per gram dry weight than uh, any terrestrial uh, vegetation. Um, as a result of this project, Sri Lanka was chosen to head the Commonwealth League on, uh, on climate change and Seacology was uh, awarded the UN Climate 
uh, what was it called, Environmental Action Award, and we're nominated for the Peace Prize in Oslo. Um, anyway, a lot of good people uh, have really pitched in to help Seekology, and uh, I, I, I made a gift of intellectual property. I developed Seekology, and so a lot of people chipped in, and so Barbara and I uh, got to, uh, just right before the, the pandemic, uh, visit Fiji to dedicate our uh, 350th school, or, or, or we've done 350 schools or water supplies or uh, medical clinics in 65 nations around the world. And this was in a very remote part of Fiji in a remote island. These people never had a proper school. So we built this. Barbara and I went down for the dedication. This little girl came up, asked if she could have her picture with Barbara. Uh, we found out this little girl walks 14 kilometers every day to get to that school and she's barefoot. Um, as part of this, because the remote setting we built, uh, also uh, um, housing for the teachers, we put in water tanks and solar electrification panels and stuff. And in return, they've protected now their coastal forest. Um, and, and in Kenya, uh, uh, over in the uh, islands there east of Kenya, uh, we, we made a deal with this village to uh, build them water cisterns and re in return they're replanting mangroves and protecting the ones they have. So it's been a really wonderful uh, opportunity to help people. Uh, currently, we've made projects, typically schools, water supplies and medical clinics in uh, 64 countries, preserving about a million and a half acres of rainforest or coral reef. Uh, instead of telling people what they need, we just ask them, well, what do you need? What do you want? And, and usually it's a school or a water supply, occasionally solar electrification scheme. Uh, here in South Talmay, this is quite interesting. There's a beach we're very interested in where turtles are hatched. And these people said, we want showers. You said, what? They said, yeah, we need commercial showers. So we, or communal showers. So we built showers for these people and they're happy and they preserved it. So it's sort of a win-win situation where we partner with uh, indigenous peoples who, in essence, become force multipliers for conservation. So moving on, um, we founded uh, in Jackson, Wyoming, where I'd lived as a boy. My dad was a uh, national park ranger, a seasonal ranger there. My mother uh, was a fish virologist at the uh, uh, Federal Diagnostic Fish Labs. Founded a not-for-profit research institute based on the idea of using patterns of illness and wellness among indigenous people discover new drugs. Uh, much of the work you're gonna hear here has uh, been performed by Dr. James Metcalf uh, from Scotland, Dr. Rachel Dunlop from Australia, Dr. Sandra Bannock from Canada, Dr. Uh, Walter Bradley from England. These are our core um, scientists and we have a, a consortium of 50 scientists around the world who participate regularly. Um, we began a really intensive study of two villages in the oceanic in the Pacific Ocean island of Guam. Uh, Dr. Susan Merch then was doing a postdoc with me. She's now a professor at the University of British Columbia, uh, probably the most gifted amino acid chemist in uh, certainly in North America. Uh, professor Sandra Bannock uh, from Cal State Fullerton, a, a really gifted analytical chemist, ecologist. We had some neurologists and physicians with us. We're trying to figure out why these people in these villages had this weird disease that sometimes looked like ALS, sometimes like Parkinson's, sometimes like Alzheimer's, and at its peak was killing about a quarter of the adults in these villages. So we began an intensive study ethnobotanically of these villages. I think we visited almost every family in these villages. Here's the cemetery and nomadic village. Um, we, I don't think we contacted a single family to have somebody die of this terrible disease. Um, one thing that got us uh, sort of ahead of the game was uh, Marjorie uh, Whiting a, uh, uh, of the Burns School of Medicine in the University of Hawaii um, had suggested that maybe the people's reliance on cycad seeds um, for, for flour had led to uh, some of the problems. Um, these are, of course, are gymnosperms that where there's fossil records of them uh, of great date. <clears throat> what I knew was that uh, these 
side cads produce uh, these weird aerial roots that pop through the leaf litter and these harbor cyanobacteria, which are very, very ancient uh, organisms. Um, we cultured the cyanobacteria from cycad roots in our laboratory. Uh, here you can see I've cut with my uh, pen knife an area of the root with this green area sort of showing where the cyanobacteria are. Uh, and we uh, isolated from it a very unusual and neurotoxic amino acid, a non-protein amino acid called beta methyl amino L-alanine or BMAA. The people um, take the gametophyte and the inner kernel of the seed. They wash in the water, try to remove toxic compounds, and they make tortillas or uh, um, dumplings out of it. Um, we also found that flying foxes, the people treasure, they love to eat these things, um, are major seed dispersers for the cycads. They either eat the outer fleshy part of the seeds. Um, and then when the people uh, boil the uh, flying foxes in coconut cream, they eat the whole skin, bones, everything. They get this massive amount of the neurotoxin, BMA. So the uh, um, <clears throat> hypothesis we came up with was that these cyanobacteria produce this weird neurotoxin called BMA that it accumulates in the seeds of the cycad trees and uh, gets into the people and, and causes them a serious uh, uh, illness and, and often death. Um, this was pretty alarming. It was also alarming when uh, you know, I realized that uh, you don't have to go to some remote island to be exposed to cyanobacteria. This is uh, Lake Michigan here on the left. Chicago down here and Milwaukee up here somewhere. And that's a massive uh, cyanobacteria bloom. Here's the Baltic, here's Stockholm and uh, Helsinki. Um, unfortunately, cyanobacteria blooms are widespread and increasing. It uh, breaks my heart to see them occur here in Utah, uh, particularly in Utah Lake. And we're studying them in Wyoming, Hebgen Lake, but most of our work on these are in Florida. And our colleagues at Dartmouth, the uh, University of Department of Neurology now have uh, found that if you live near one of these uh, cyanobacterial bloom attained lakes, that you're, you have a, a very high increased risk of developing uh, a neurodegenerative illness. Um, realizing what's going on in Guam, I sought for a sort of a ethnobotanical uh, comparison. I wanted to find a village that had no record of Alzheimer's or ALS. This took me to the northern tip of Okinawa you know, Gimi village famous throughout uh, uh, Japan as longevity village. As you probably know, uh, people in Okinawa have their own language. They learn Japanese in school. These people in Gimi, their village language is, is not understandable by the rest of Okinawa, uh, Okinawans. Uh, this is a little lunch that one of the village women just presented me. She didn't know I was coming. A lot of marine algae, very strange marine algae. Here's kombu, 392 micrograms, excuse me milligrams per thousand, hundred grams of, of, uh, of L-serine. Um, these people, uh, here's tofu, 23,510 milligrams per hundred grams. Um, they're getting, as far as I know, the highest amount of serine content um, in their diet. They get about four to five times what North Americans get. Um, here's a woman who's 98, and she's typical. I need to tell you this one, I, I filmed her. Um, I just want you to see how she moves here. <laughs> and uh, I, I asked her if she can um, touch her knees. Uh, and she comes over and uh, puts her hands flat on the tummy mat. Let's get her in. Let's get her in. Uh, and, and these uh, women, uh, many of whom are over 100 years old, have absolute recall to when they're three or four years old. This uh, calendar here, she writes her daily diary in very small uh, uh, kanji characters. So uh, uh, let's see if we can go on here now. Um, so we're trying to figure out what goes on. Our colleagues, read, led by Dr. Dunlop and uh, Dr. Ken Rogers in Sydney, and now we've hired her, so she's full-time in Jackson Hole. We found that this weird neurotoxin produced by cyanobacteria mischarges the uh, transfer RNA synthetase for serine, one of the 20 regular amino acids. 
knocks it off and makes the protein this fold. Um, but fortunately, they also found that if, if we increase the amount of serine in the media for uh, human neuronal cell cultures, we can stop protein misfolding and program cell death called apoptosis. So here's serine, which is one of the normal dietary amino acids in our food. Here's the neurotoxin. You can sort of see they have a similar structure and can be mis, uh, uh, mistaken by our cellular machinery. Um, so we wanted to see if this could be true in, in animals as well as in our cell culture. So we went to uh, um, St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Here's part of our research team there. Um, about 150 years ago, some sailor put off some vervets to, um, there's no natural predators there. So now there's 40,000 uh, of these animals in St. Kitts in the wild. They uh, outnumber the locals. Um, a team at Harvard established a very nice and uh, humane colony of vervets there. So we received permission to uh, test to do an experiment on these animals. Um, so each day after they'd eat, and they're all housed together. We never made any animal take a dose. We give them a banana or other piece of fruit with a uh, test substance in there. We have here a different color um, number and icon to make sure that we never miss uh, uh, dosed an animal. Some got a placebo dose of rice flour. Some got uh, the neurotoxin. Some got the neurotoxin plus serine. Um, some got serine alone as a positive control. Uh, we did this for 140 days at a dose, which essentially telescoped a lifetime villager exposure and uh, succeeded in recreating the village disease uh, in this model. Uh, this is, uh, these are, uh, this, this is misfolded tau proteins. These are, these are, are neurons, the neuro neuropathologists call them tombstones. There's neuropil threads and all sorts of other neurons. Um, most neurologists I've shown this to a diagnosis immediately as an Alzheimer's patient. We also produced uh, amyloid 42 in these animals. But we found that those animals that had the neurotoxin and which we added L-serine to their diet we're able to reduce the density of this neuropathology by about 85%. The animals that were unexposed to the toxin had none of this neuropathology whatsoever. So we published this over in London um, and immediately went to the FDA. Um, we ran a phase one trial, which was successful. We found that we could reduce disease um, in, in neurodegenerative patients by about 85%. Uh, FDA was very great with us. We went to a second clinical trial, which was randomized, double-blinded placebo controlled. We went here, we made gummies, uh, both that have L-serine or some that have placebo. Uh, we're just about ready to get data from this trial. We're pretty excited about this um, to see what happens. Uh, and now uh, this coming, uh, uh, well, in the next month or two, uh, we're launching a phase two trial for mild cognitive impairment at Houston Meth Methodist uh, uh, Research Center. Uh, MCI is a precursor state to Alzheimer's, so people are still pretty functional, but they're having serious memory lapses. We got permission from the FDA to uh, uh, dose 100 patients with either LC or placebo at the uh, Houston Methodist Medical Center. These are MCI patients, the trials led by a real Alzheimer's pioneer, uh, Dr. Uh, Gustavo Roman. Uh, before and after, they'll have MRI, PET FDG scans, and cognitive testing. Um, we're very interested in glucose burns. We found in our primates that uh, uh, those animals that received serine were having better glucose burns in their brains. Uh, we have some preliminary data that indicate uh, 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 that uh, there's a cognitive improvement with L-serine. So, and there's no FDA approved drug for phase two uh, mild cognitive impairment. So we're, you know, depending on the pandemic because it's hammered in Houston, as soon as that abates, we'll uh, launch this trial. Um, and we've really been, the FDA has been very great with this. Uh, when we initially began a trial on zinc, but as soon as we discovered uh, L-serine, we uh, dropped that and, uh, um, you know, indicate in 2013, our first belief this could be a potential drug. FDA approved our phase one trial in four days, which I think is a record for the FDA. 
2016 publisher phase one trial data. Phase two began in 2017. And we're doing both ALS and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. COVID's messed up uh, patient recruitment in New Hampshire. Um, but we now have an MCI trial approved and very hopeful we'll be able to launch this in the next month or two. So I think I'd like to stop there. Um, I, I think the major conclusion that I, I'd really like to uh, say is that uh, um, indigenous people have uh, really uh, got their act together. They understand in, uh, native plants. They understand how they can be used for food, for medicine, for basketry. And because of their kindness to us, uh, we're able now to uh, use some of their experiences in both illness and wellness uh, to discover new drugs.